people who, who want to see this. All right, shalom and welcome to today's class. Like I said, I'm sorry I missed last week. You guys, I was traveling and am now on location in the uh, on the island again. So I was required to be here. There's nothing I could do about it. And, uh, you know, it's actually taken me a few days to get over 16 hours of travel. So um, jet lag is a, a real thing. And uh, it really messed me up. Um, so I think I'm, I'm, I'm back to normal now, even though I'm getting up really early here. But back home is probably not so early, but it's really early here. Anyway, um, the last time I saw you guys, um, and this was in between uh, Helen and Milton, <laughs> um, y'all had been dealing with me on, on a couple of things since uh, the, the last class we had in uh, when I was in Tennessee still, before the storm hit there. And, uh, you know, where I, he was dealing with me where I've been making some compromises. And, uh, you know, my intention was with this class to was to streamline it, make it a little easier and not, not so complicated for some people. And uh, I ended up making it a little more more of a problem for myself. And uh, what I mean by that is um, I didn't focus too much on some um, certain truths. Uh, that I know to be true. Um, I was even willing to accept people into the group that had um, bad doctrine, even though I, you know, even though I knew it was bad doctrine, I was willing to have them in here, hopefully to, to, you know, coach them in, along and, and eventually they would, would, you know, figure out these things. Because like I said, over in discord, the codes are essentially uh, for one of the purpose is a tool to uh, reconcile the Bible, you guys. We can we can reconcile the word with this if we know how to use it as a tool. And what I mean by that is, you know, there's some things that are um, man-made traditions and it's woven into what we believe and what we've been taught in Christianity. And sometimes we have a hard time separating that from um, what is truth, you know, uh, and what is you know, church truth, right? And so I've been praying about that this week because I, I really feel this urgency to get everybody on the same sheet of music and everybody in sync because I think all the chaos and, and problems that we've experienced in the class, it, you know, in particular with the downloads and things like that is because of me. And, and I'm, I bear the responsibility of that, you guys, I'm in making compromises. And sometimes I coddle, sometimes I... Uh, I'm a people pleaser and uh, I'm all these things and I admit it. So uh, I want to change that up and uh, get, get down to fundamental basics and some things. And one of those things, and I mentioned this to you guys before, especially with a couple of the students who left about the identity crisis. Well, there's more than one way to, you know, get this point across. We don't have to use somebody whose reputation is destroyed now and now has negated a very good teaching. And I'm talking about identity crisis. You know, um, when you when you put out something so profound like that, sometimes the enemy comes and murders your reputation to destroy what you put out. Everybody understand what I'm saying? And that's unfortunate. But there's more than one way to get this point across. And I think with Nehemiah Gordon is a good place to start. And for me, you know, many years ago, that was uh, with a teaching that he put out about um you know, the historical Yeshua compared to the Greek Jesus that we get through Christianity, okay? And trust me, you guys, you'll see that there are two different, and sometimes even more, because with, with denominations, they tend to, to create their own version of Jesus, right? And this is a problem, and this leads to a tremendous amount of error, misinterpretation of the Bible, and leading people into... Um, you know, dangerous places. You know, I gotta, I gotta remind you about Matthew seven in a place where Yeshua talks about, you know, people in the last days that come to him who are obviously Christians that say, Lord, Lord, didn't we do all these things in your name? We did this and we did that. Right. And he says, I don't know who you are. And, and, and the scariest words mentioned anywhere in the, in the new Testament, Yeshua says, depart from me. I, I don't know who you are. 
right? Scariest words. We do not want to be those people. Everybody agree with that, right? I mean, can we just establish that right now? We don't want to be that group of people. So we got to get to the down to reality and understand who Yeshua is and who Pharisees are. Incidentally, that's a term thrown away, thrown around really loosely um, because I observe the feast or I use the name of the father and the son in its correct terms. Or, you know, I keep the Ten Commandments and, you know, some dietary laws and things like that, which is not a burden. But because I do those things, some people call me a Pharisee and put myself under the law and yada, yada, yada. And it's a whole, it's, it creates problems, you guys, and people reject you for that. But, um, you know, that's okay. And so this is one of the reasons why I was making these compromises. And it created a mess. So I want to start over. <laughs> We're still going to do codes, but for, for the next couple of weeks, the first part of the class, I want to, get, you know, cover some of these basics. And then we'll, we'll, we'll the last part of the class, we'll, we'll trans, transition over to sharing codes and things like that. Okay. Let me open up with prayer and then we will get started with something I saw this week that, you know, as I'm thinking about this and I'm, and I'm thinking about people's perception of Yeshua. Because everybody, you know, thinks they're right in their own heart, and they follow after the uh, a Yeshua that they have, you know, envisioned in themselves, right? But what is the historical Yeshua, and do we know him? That's a big question, right? So we're going to cover that in just a moment, and then uh, we're going to slowly go through Nehemiah's uh, um, video. I'm breaking this up between two classes, you guys, because it's like a two-hour video, and I don't want to go through two hours of video with you guys and put some of you to sleep. But I think it's critical that we get this information down, okay? So if you just trust me, just for the next couple of weeks to, to hold your hand and walk you through some of these things, maybe you already know, okay? Um, but for some people, and especially those that I'm, if they see this on YouTube, um, this is a critical hour, you guys. And we've got a mess in the United States, especially with Christianity, okay? A mess. There's witchcraft in the church. There's all kinds of crazy stuff going on, all right? And, you know, we have this mental vision of the United States as being this righteous and, and Christian country, and we've got a mess, right? So uh, broad is the way to destruction. Narrow is the way to the truth, okay? We've got to remember that. Not everybody's going to find that, right? All right, so this is, um, first, let me start off with prayer. I'll be you who Father, I thank you for this this day and this opportunity to gather again once once again with these students, Father, and, and I just invite you, the Ruach HaKodesh, to join us in this meeting, that you cover us in your wisdom and with your protection. Father, lead us in this meeting. Reveal yourself through your word. Father, give me the words to say to this class. You put this on my heart, Father. I'm open to you and willing uh, to set things aside and get down to basics, Father. And so I turn it over to you. You are in control, and uh, we just lift it up to you, Father. We give you all thanks, and uh, we ask for your blessing and protection on this meeting. In Yeshua's name, amen. All right. Here's where I want to start with you guys. This video was a little bit shocking to me, you guys, because I realized that, and I know this from just talking to people about Yeshua or Jesus or, or their version of Jesus, right? And I hear a lot of bizarre things. Even just last night, I was, I was talking to somebody who has got this Christ consciousness kind of um, mentality. And, you know, when I was listening to this person talk to me about their version of Jesus, Folks, I was shocked. I was shocked at what I was hearing. And I knew, I knew it was deception of the enemy. It's one of those feel good kind of things that Jesus is all about love. And he doesn't, he doesn't judge anybody. And, you know, we should be about higher vibes and all this kind of stuff. And it was just a bunch of new age crap. Okay. And it's not the Yeshua that I know. And I recognized that immediately. Watch this video that Nehemiah put out, and I think this is way, way back, um, um, maybe five, eight years ago, something like that. This is what Michael Rood 
And something Nehemia Gordon says in this about Yeshua. You're raised uh, uh, an Orthodox Jew, became a Karite. You're not a believer in Yeshua, and um, and uh, you know we make no apologies for that at all. That's uh, that's where y your background. That's where you came from. I'm definitely not Messianic, and uh, you know by by. Your definition, I would not be considered a believer in Yeshua. Absolutely, that's correct. Okay, by, so, by my definition. Yeah. However, I but I have to say something that, that well, and, uh, and I, I don't want to you know mis you know misrepresent who I am. I'm I'm not a believer in Yeshua. I think Yeshua was this. I now understand he's this amazing teacher, and I believe in the thing many of the things that he taught. And in that you know, I, I found a lot of people who say they're believers in Yeshua, but they, it seems like they be, don't believe him. Um, right. Very profound word there, right? A little bit about Nehemiah. Nehemiah is a Kirite Jew. He follows only the Tanakh. He doesn't follow after the rabbis. And he is friends with several Christian theologians and teachers and even some Messianic teachers. And through this bond of this, um, the two sticks coming together, literally, like the prophet says, Judah and Ephraim will come together. I see that in these these men because they share information. Nehemiah brings a lot to the table that we need to, to absorb, you guys, because he brings a perspective that brings understanding. If we don't understand the Hebraism, Hebraisms and the idiom, idioms and the metaphors and, and the, the language of the Bible, we will not understand the, the word, right? And indeed, even through Christianity, we've got error where, you know, doctrines have been invented by men. And people don't know their Bible, and they don't even know who Yeshua is. Listen to what he says. This man is not even a, even though he, he believes in Yeshua as a rabbi, as a teacher, he's not at the place where he, he admits that he's the Messiah yet. And this was several years ago, so um, even though he, he just posted this video as a clip recently, I believe that there's going to come a point where Nehemiah actually see. There's no way that he can study the the New Testament this much and not come to the conclusion that Yeshua is the Messiah. Everybody understand? I, I believe that in him. But at this point of this video, he's not there. But he knows more about Yeshua than most Christians. They don't. They don't do what he says to do. They don't believe what he well, said. And I'll and, tell you uh, where I'm coming from. I know this isn't the topic you wanted to get into, but oh, in, it is. In it Exodus, is. it says it says Bayaminu. By Yehovah u Moshe Avdo, and they believed in Yehovah and in Moses' servant. Now, what did it mean they believed in the servant of Moses? Um, I believe in Moses, but what that means is if Moses teaches me to do something, I do it to the best of my ability. That's mm -hmm. what it means that I believe in Moses. Mm -hmm. um, and I find a lot of people who say that they're believers in Yeshua who, you know, uh, I think it was Billy Graham who said that Christ came to do three days' work. He came to the earth to do three days work, meaning all of that ministry before that, that, that wasn't what they ignore that. <laughs> Michael, that, I gotta, I that, gotta, that is almost comedy right there. Billy Graham actually said that. I don't that. know if it was Billy Graham. It was somebody like that. I'll, I'll be oh, honest. Oh, I don't remember okay. who. All right. We won't, we won't a, lay it on Billy it's then. It's a famous saying um, that Christ came to do three days work. And what he means is the death and resurrection. And, and really the attitude of many Christians is all of those things he taught, the bulk of the gospels are completely irrelevant. I, I heard this lecture from a professor of New Testament studies once, and he was saying how, um, he was talking about this creed, the creed they recite in many churches, the Apostles' Creed, Apostles I think creed. it's called, mm -hmm. called, and they talk about how Christ was born of a virgin, suffered under Pilate, etc. And he said, what's missing from that creed? And you know, I certainly don't know, but he was talking to a Christian group, and they didn't know. And he said, what's missing is everything between born of a virgin and suffered under Pilate. The actual bulk of his ministry isn't part of their creed, which is profound. Think about that. <laughs> it's um, uh, uh, nine tenths of the gospel record. I mean, well, and, and I uh, want to share a story. So I was sitting on an airplane to um, to Seattle. Go, I was going to speak at a conference and visit my sister, who is a professor at University of Washington. And um, I was sitting next to this American soldier, this young lady, about 22 years old, and she was telling me how she started going to church when she was a teenager, about 15, um, and she went to a church called the Church of Christ the King. And, um, and she decided to be baptized when she was around 19 or 20. And then we were talking and I was telling her about kind of like what I do and you know, share about the history of, of Jesus. And I could, I, I could tell that she didn't seem to really know anything about who this Jesus Yeshua was. And I said to her, have you ever read the gospels? And she said, no, but I saw the movie. Uh, I said, well, which movie? And she 
The Passion of the Christ with Mel Gibson. And, and, I, and I said, so why do you go to this church? She said, I, I really like it because we have really nice songs and the pastor doesn't bore us with the Bible. He tells us stories about life. And, and I realized this woman doesn't know the basic stories of the Gospels. Mm -hmm. and, and I asked her, do you know these stories? Like she didn't even see the greatest story ever told. You know, <laughs> she saw just, you know, and if you think about the Passion of the Christ is only the last seven. Folks, if you didn't know, this would be churches like uh, Joel Osteen, okay? They don't teach the Bible to tell feel-good stories, right? So this, this young lady had no idea, right? This is the condition we are in. 72 hours or so of, of Yeshua's existence on earth, right? I mean, you know, if I was, you know, death and resurrection. Um, uh, and so I, um, I said to her, do you know what the... the the life and, and, and teachings of, of Jesus of Nazareth. And, and she said, no, I don't. Can you tell me? And so there I am sitting on an airplane. Literally, I'm a Karite Jew and I'm sharing the gospels with this young Christian woman, literally. And I'm not trying to convert her, not trying to change her, but she's genuinely wants to know, oh, so yeah, so Jesus was an actual person. What are the things that he taught? And I'm, you know, sharing with her, you know, he, uh, you know, how the, the gospels say he was a descendant of King David and born in Bethlehem, grew up in Nazareth, moved to Capernaum, was teaching the Jewish multitudes the Sermon on the Mount. She had never heard of this stuff. <laughs> uh, that, that is un that's unbelievable. And, and, and but, this actually ties into what we're talking about here in Matthew 23, that many Christians completely disregard the things that Yeshua taught. But I think what, where, where you came to it is you were dealing with p people who were saying, okay, we're not going to ignore everything between born of a virgin and suffered under Pilate. So we have to take his word seriously. Now what do we do? What did he actually teach? I think everybody can agree that if you say you believe in Jesus, if you say you believe in Yeshua, you ought to know what he said and to take it seriously. Yeah. And from my Jewish perspective, it'd be like me saying, I believe in Moses. Um, and boy, is this a great ham sandwich. Wait a minute, I thought you said you believe in Moses. Yeah, I believe in him. <laughs> I, you know, okay, but if you believe in him, do what he says. That, you know. There you go. You know, he, he, Moses didn't come for us just to believe in him. Moses came to teach us. And I, and I, I'm convinced now, I wouldn't have said this 20 years ago before, when we met, but I'm convinced now that Yeshua had a, had a message for the Jewish people and for the world, and I see all these people who say they believe in him, and they, they believe he was born of a virgin and suffered under Pilate and everything in between they could care less about. You guys, this is what, this is the, the, what I'm talking about here. And uh, this is just one little story, right, of um, the condition of the, quote, church. So my point in all this is we cannot, as a group, go deep into the hidden things of Yah unless we know him and we know his nature. We know the teachings that he gave us. We know the teachings from Yeshua. And, and what I'm asking of you is to be willing, okay, at least to be willing that if you are confronted with something, that you don't just bolt and run, that you deal with it. You let the Bible reconcile that because if, you, if you're not careful, the enemy will come with your ego and with your pride and with your feelings and he will steal, he will steal it away from you and cause you to walk away from something that's very profound, okay? So I'm asking you to just be patient with me in the next you know, couple of weeks and let me lay some foundation for us. And then we can have conversations on, on some of the things. There's a brother in this group, guys, who's got a talent. And there's several of you to do a, 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 an anointing for doing this. And he's coming from, you know, a doctrine that is, is, you know, very confrontational, about, particularly about the Sabbath, what the Bible says the Sabbath is, right? It's a man-made tradition that he's been, he's been holding on to. And so he is, in his life, going to have to confront that, right? And that might be, for different degrees, something that happens with each one of you. And all I'm asking is that you be willing to confront that, okay? Um, and and, and um, endure, right? So, interpretation of the bible we we see this this wild west kind of um thing of, of many different interpretations of what the scripture says and what it means and, and things like that you guys 
And um, sometimes, particularly, um, you know, getting the English translation that's been translated from the Greek, we can lose things in translation, right? And, and uh, Nehemiah is going to cover that in this next segment that I'm going to show you and how things are lost between the, the Jewish Yeshua and the Greek Jesus, right? And there's a reason why his, his video is titled this is because um, it, it, you essentially, if you examine both, what we've been taught about Jesus, right? Even the name and then who Yeshua was, you actually see two different people. Okay. If you, if you go down the line, you, you actually see there, there are similarities. Absolutely. But there are clear distinctions and sometimes contradictions between the two. All right. So, and, and I believe the reason for this is because we come from a perspective where we don't understand the man. Everybody follow what I'm saying, right? So Nehemiah is going to clear this up, and he's going to do that by talking about the five principles of Phariseeism. We see in the, in the in the New Testament that Yeshua was coming against the Pharisees constantly, right? He was always challenging them, right? And most Christians will interpret that as, see, Jesus was coming against the law. He nailed it to the cross, and that's not exactly what he was doing. He was coming against the Talmudic laws of the rabbis. But we see it because we only see the word law that he was coming against the Torah. The Torah and the oral tradition, which is the Talmud, are two different things, right? And you're going to see in, in just a moment that one is actually apostate. This is the conclusion that an Orthodox Jewish man came to when he was a very when he was a younger man, and he eventually moved over to be a Karite, right? There's a reason for that. He was confronted with truth. It didn't line up with what he was being taught, and he confronted it. Everybody follow where I'm leading you. He confronted it. And what did God do? If you are, listen, if you are willing to lay something down and, and say, I want the truth, Father, guess what? He'll lead you to it, right? But if you are, if you are clinging to doctrines of men like a life preserver and you're not willing to let it go guess what y'all is going to do he's going to let you cling to it okay so my my job here is to help you if, if there's a problem get to the point where you you stop clinging to that and cling to the father and cling to what he's what he's revealing to you okay you guys so nehemiah is going to help us with that i'm going to stop the video uh periodically and kind of discuss what he's saying because it's very profound all right so uh if, if you if you're you know set got something to drink uh very good teaching okay this is one of the places where i started when i started transitioning or crossing over by the way that word hebrew the word hebrew means to cross over ebrit means to cross over okay that's exactly right open your ears and, and exactly right be willing to set things down and let the Bible speak to you and let the let the Holy Spirit lead you to truth. Okay. I found that with Nehemiah. Nehemiah is, is a scholar. He is unbiased. He he comes from a place where he's not biased with, with traditions of men in the Christian scene. He is telling you how it is coming from a Jewish perspective. He understands Yeshua better than we do, you guys. And there's a reason for that. Because Yeshua was a Jewish man and he kept the Torah. And he kept the feast, right? He wasn't nailing it to the cross. What he was doing when he came to fulfill the law, you guys, he was coming to fulfill the law of death. That was what he was fulfilling. But also the feast to the moment, the moment that he was on the cross, he was fulfilling, you know, um, uh, Passover and uh, um, first fruits and unleavened bread, all of that at once in that period, Right. That doesn't mean it's gone away. That means that means we 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 understand the observance now, and we're told that in the kingdom that all nations are going to be required to keep the feast, right? So it don't matter what you are or what you claim to be, we're required to keep those feasts, right? So fundamentals. Let's go to a really good classic from Nehemiah uh, when he first came on the scene. It's called the Hebrew Yeshua and the Greek Jesus. Introducing Nehemiah Gordon of Jerusalem, Israel, teaching on the Hebrew Yeshua versus the Greek Jesus. 
presented during his January 2005 speaking tour in the United States. And now, Nehemiah Gordon. It was a few years ago that Michael Rood came to me and he asked me about a verse in the Gospel of Matthew that we're about to look at. And there Yeshua says in Matthew, he says, The scribes and the Pharisees sit in Moses' seat. All therefore whatsoever they bid you observe, that observe and do. And what Yeshua seems to be saying here is that the scribes and the Pharisees, they sit in the seat of Moses. They have some type of Mosaic authority. Whatever they bid you observe, whatever they command you to do, that you must do if you're a disciple of Yeshua. And actually I've dressed today as a modern day Pharisee. I don't normally dress this way. But I've dressed in the garb of a modern day Pharisee to illustrate to you what it would mean to obey the Pharisees. You would have to dress according to the traditional Pharisaical dress and follow Pharisaical practices. This is what it would mean to obey the Pharisees. Now what is this seat of Moses? What's a, what's a Moses' seat? Well, this is a Moses' seat from the ancient synagogue of Chorazin in the Galilee that was unearthed by archaeologists. And the idea of a Moses' seat was that there was a special stone chair in the synagogue where the head of the synagogue would sit and teach with authority. And what Yeshua seems to be saying is that the Pharisees are the ones that teach with authority, so do whatever they tell you to do. You must obey them if you believe and obey what Yeshua says. Here's a Moses' seat from ancient synagogue at Delos. This is uh, from an island in Greece. This is actually the oldest synagogue that's ever been unearthed by archaeologists. And already in the first synagogue ever found by archaeologists, this is one of these seats of Moses, these Moses' seats where the head of the synagogue would sit and teach with authority. And what Yeshua seems to be saying very clearly is that the Pharisees are the ones that sit in the seat of Moses. Whatever they command you to do, if you are a disciple of Yeshua, you must do that. Well, a few years back, Michael came to me and asked me what I thought of this verse. And I explained to Michael that as a, I'm a Karaite Jew. Karaite is a Hebrew word that refers to Jews who only believe in the Old Testament. And as a Karaite Jew, I don't actually look to Yeshua as the Messiah. So my first reaction was, well, I see you have a problem, Michael, but it's not my problem, it's your problem. <laughs> But I agreed to look at this and research this as a textual problem. I have a background in academia. I have a degree in biblical studies and archaeology from the Hebrew University of Jerusalem. And I've worked in various research projects, such as a, as a translator on the Dead Sea Scroll Reader. So I said, okay, here's a 2,000-year-old text, which doesn't make a lot of sense. There's a problem here. Let's see if I can apply linguistic and textual tools on this, like I would on a problem in the Dead Sea Scrolls or any ancient text. And what really is the problem, though? What, what's the problem? What does it mean to obey the Pharisees? Well, I knew exactly what this meant because I was actually raised as a, as a Pharisee, as a modern Orthodox Jew. Before I became a Karite and Old Testament Jew, I, I uh, was raised as a Pharisee. And one of the things I knew was that to obey the Pharisees would mean to follow rules and regulations that govern every aspect of life, literally from the moment you wake up in the morning until the moment you go to sleep at night. And here's an example of uh, one of these rules and regulations, something that I was taught growing up, I was taught that uh, from the Shulchan Aruch, which is a universally accepted guide to modern Pharisaical living, and there the Pharisees teach that when a person wakes up in the morning, first he must put on his right shoe, but not tie it. Then he must put on his left shoe and tie it and go back and tie his right shoe. Now, do you really think that Yeshua was commanding you to obey the Pharisees tell you to do these things? But that's what it said. That's what it says in Matthew 23. Whatsoever they bid you observe, whatsoever they command you to do, that observe and do. Do that. And it really seems that he's uh, commanding his disciples to obey these rules and regulations that cover every aspect of life. By the way, it gets, it gets even better because another rabbi came along and added some notes to this book and he lived in a country where they didn't have shoelaces. And he, literally, he explains, even with our shoes which do not have laces, a person must still put on his right shoe first. Now, if you were going to obey whatever the Pharisees command you to do, you not only have to dress in this manner, but you have to put on the clothes according to specific rules and regulations. And is that really what Yeshua is commanding? Is that what he's commanding you as his disciples to do? Uh, well, when I was having this discussion with Michael, I said, okay, Michael, I, I see this as very inconvenient for you as, as a disciple of Yeshua. It's, like, it's not my problem, it's yours. But other than the great inconvenience of obeying the people that tell you which shoe to put on first in the morning, what makes you think that's not what Yeshua says? Because, or that's not what Yeshua meant. He clearly says that. And Michael pointed me to some verses in uh, the very same passage in Matthew 23. For example, Matthew 23, verse 13, Yeshua says there, he's speaking to the Pharisees, he says, Woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites! 
For you shut up the kingdom of heaven against men. You neither go in yourselves, neither suffer you that are entering to go in. Now here, ten verses later, after saying the Pharisees have Mosaic authority, that they sit in the seat of Moses and you should obey them, he then says they shut up the kingdom of heaven against men. So what's going on here? Something doesn't fit. Something, something's not meshing here. Here's another verse. Matthew 23, verse 27. Woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites! You are like unto whited sepulchres, whited graves, whited tombs, which, are indeed, which indeed appear beautiful outward, but are within full of dead men's bones and of all uncleanness. Now is Yeshua really commanding his disciples to obey these Pharisees? Whatsoever they bid you observe, that observe and do. But, but that's what it says. Now, I still wasn't convinced. I said to Michael, okay, Yeshua, what Yeshua seems to me to be saying in the English is that the Pharisees are hypocrites. And because they are hypocrites, they make these burdens and they foist them up upon the nation. Uh, because they have Mosaic authority, they have the right to do that even though they don't, they don't actually do their own commandments. They make all these man-made laws, but, which they have the Mosaic authority to do, according to Yeshua in Matthew 23, verses 2 to 3, but they don't actually follow these laws themselves because they're hypocrites, and that's how they keep people out of the kingdom of heaven. And so I said, well, what makes you think, what really makes you think that you don't have to obey the Pharisees? And Michael mentioned to me, well, there's another account that seems to be contrary to Yeshua instructing his disciples to obey the Pharisees, and that's the account in Matthew 15 of the washing of the hands. This is a very interesting account that I had come into contact with many years before. Uh, oh, about 10 years ago, living in Jerusalem, I met a very interesting fellow. And he one day revealed to me that he was actually a Torah-keeping Christian. And I had no idea what that meant. I said, Torah-keeping Christian? What on earth is a Torah-keeping Christian? I've lived in Israel for 12 years, but I was born and raised in Chicago. And in Chicago, all the Christians I'd ever met always told me that the Torah is a curse that was laid upon Israel, and Jesus died to set them free from the curse. They're now free from the law. The freedom through... Uh, and, and I said, so, okay, what then is a Torah-keeping Christian? If most Christians are... Let me just interject right here, right? We're the Torah-keeping Christian, and then, the, and then we're, most of the church talks about the, the, the law being a curse, Right? Just like we get this duality with the actual Yeshua and the the church version, there's a duality with the word law as well, because the law is kind of broad. It doesn't just mean Torah. It can also mean rabbinical law, right? And so we will see, he's pointing out a contradiction uh, from Yeshua in, in Matthew, and we're going to see the clarity of that in just a moment. It's because we don't understand what he's saying. And it seems like he's contradicting himself. And incidentally, Yeshua and Paul do the same thing. Paul and Yeshua contradict each other in certain places. Did you guys, you guys are very aware of that. And this leads to doctrine that te teaches you, well, Yeshua was teaching only to the Jews and Paul's teaching to the Gentiles. Misunderstanding what the word Gentile means, right? Nations, goyim. We're going to cover that later, but... The uses of words, even that on the surface, can lead a person down a, a, a long road of, of deception, okay? They're saying the Torah is a curse. Why are you keeping this curse? And he knew I was a Karite Jew, and he knew that Karites being Old Testament are very uh, textually oriented. And rather than explain to me in theory, he said, okay, let me show you in the New Testament the actual words of Yeshua that will explain to you what I mean by a Torah-keeping Christian. And my friend opened up to me to Matthew chapter 5, verse 18, and showed me the words of Yeshua himself. And there Yeshua says, For verily I say unto you, till heaven and earth pass... By the way, are heaven and earth still around? Yeah. Yes, they are. Okay, that's a good thing. Till heaven and earth pass, one jot or one tittle shall no wise pass from the law, till all be fulfilled. And my Torah-keeping Christian friend explained to me, uh, he said, look, you see, it's very clear. Yeshua didn't come to do away with the Torah. Not even the most minutest point of the Torah, the jots and the tittles, the dots and the dashes, even the smallest points of, uh, of Torah, even those Yeshua didn't come to do away with. <clears throat> I thought this was very interesting and, and really very refreshing. This was certainly much better than the Torah is a curse and Jesus died to set them free from the curse. And I said, okay, so this means you do everything that it says in the Torah, the most minutest points. The jots, the tittles, everything in the Torah you do. And he says, yes, everything in the Torah, but, knew there was a but coming there, but there are certain things that Yeshua did do away with. Okay, I figured, you know, it was too good to be true. For example, like what I asked him, 
And he explained to me that originally in the Torah there was a commandment that before a person eats that they must wash their hands. And Yeshua came and did away with this, this old ritual, this extraneous ritual. And I said, you know, I grew up as a Pharisee, washing my hands before I eat uh, several times a day, two or three times a day. Every time I went to eat a proper meal, I had to go through the Pharisee ritual of washing the hands. And so I immediately said to him, okay, you're telling me Yeshua did away with this law from the Torah. Where does it say in the Torah that a person must wash their hands before they eat? Because I knew it wasn't in the Torah. Uh, and he, but he was sure it had to be there, and he opens up to Leviticus, and he starts flipping through the pages trying to find it. It had to be in, you know, with all those rituals and sacrifices in Leviticus and Numbers, and he can't find it. And I'm telling him it's not there. And after, after a little while, he believes me and says, okay, well, if this isn't from the Torah, then where is it from? And I was raised with this uh, rabbinical practice, and so I knew it wasn't from the Torah. And before I explain to you where it comes from, let me illustrate to you what it actually means to wash the hands. This is a special ritual that the Pharisees practice. And the Pharisee ritual of washing the hands, it begins with a, the Pharisee ritual of washing the hands begins with a special jug that fulfills certain requirements and specifications. And you take that jug, and by the way, if I take a bar of soap and rub it over my hands and put water on them, I have not fulfilled the ritual of washing my hands. I have to use the jug and do specific ritual. The ritual begins, I pour water over my left hand, then I pour water over my right hand, and then I do this a second time, pour water over my left hand, and pour water over my right hand. And according to some traditions, I do this a third time. I pour water over my left hand, and pour water over my right hand. And I hey guys, so if you know your Bible and the New Testament, and, and every encounter of Yeshua had with the Pharisees, right, or, or the priest, one of the times was about washing of the hands, which is a ritual. It's a man-made tradition. It comes out of Babylon. And the Jews were doing this in the time of Yeshua, but it's not in the Torah. This is what this Christian was figuring out. You see, how he misunderstood the Hebrew, Hebraisms and the idioms and the metaphors and, and the language of the Bible. And by the way, the Bible is an agri uh, agrarian book. So if we don't know agriculture in ancient times, you can misunderstand a lot, especially the calendar. So this Christian is discovering, wait a minute. So there's a difference between the Torah and the Talmud. It's two different laws. But to the Jews, when the Jews refer to it, guess what? It's all the same thing. And so when you see Paul coming against the law, because we're reading it in the English, right? And you see him in one chapter coming against the law, but yet in another chapter, he says the law is good. Is Paul, is Paul bipolar? No. It's lost in the translation because we're reading it in the English, and it seems like he's saying the law is good in one place and the law is bad. You follow what I'm saying? How dangerous it is and how doctrines get, get started. Because if we don't understand the entomology of words and how they're used in, in the scriptures, right? Uh, you know, some people think, some, some Christian theologians believe that the Greek is superior. I don't agree with that, you guys. I believe the original Hebrew is where it's at and that a lot is lost. Um, Hemi is going to kind of point that out here in just a moment. And I still have not fulfilled the Pharisee ritual of washing the hands because I have not done the most important part of this ritual. And the key part of this ritual I have not done is the blessing that comes after the actual pouring of the water. And the blessing in Hebrew goes as follows. Which translated into English reads, Blessed art thou, Lord, King of the universe, who has sanctified us with his commandments, commanding us to wash the hands. And this is what Pharisees say every time they eat bread, every time they sit down for a proper meal. They wash their hands and make this blessing. And I actually grew up with this blessing, saying this on a daily basis. And at a certain point, I went to my rabbis and I said, we're saying this all the time, several times a day, where are we actually commanded to wash the hands? If we're making this blessing, commanding us to wash the hands, where is that commandment in the Torah? And I'd already by this point started to study Torah. And they explained to me that there's actually nowhere in the Torah are we commanded to wash the hands. However, the rabbis have uh, made what's called a rabbinical enactment. The rabbis, according to the rabbis, have the authority to make enactments that add new laws to the Torah, add new laws that the people must follow. And these rabbinical enactments, these are called in Hebrew, 
by the Hebrew word takanot. Takanot refers to these rabbinical enactments. That's really a very important concept, takanot. That's something we're going to see again later tonight. So let's everybody, let's everybody say together this word, takanot. takanot. Okay. So these takanot are these rabbinical enactments, and the classic example of one of the takanot is the commandment of the rabbis to wash the hands. Well, I asked my rabbi, okay, the rabbis made this enactment to wash the hands. Uh, why are we blessing God for commanding us to do that? And my rabbis explained to me that God has given the rabbis the authority to make these enactments, and by obeying the rabbis, you're indirectly obeying God. Now, I asked, where, where are we... Where did the rabbis given the authority to make these enactments? And they said, oh, stop asking so many questions. And actually, we're going to see a little bit later what the real source for that is. And it's, it's uh, quite shocking. But so this, uh, the, the washing of the hands is a rabbinical, one of these rabbinical takanot. And when I explained this to my Torah-keeping Christian friend, he was in shock. He, he, didn't, he couldn't believe it. Because he had been certain this was a law from the old covenant that Yeshua died to set him free from. And when I showed him this is actually a man-made law that the rabbi sat down one day and enacted, he said, okay, well, what's going on here? Let's go back to Matthew 15 and see what's really happening, because he had completely missed this. Is this really reflected in Matthew 15? And we looked at Matthew 15, verses 2 to 3, and there the Pharisees come to Yeshua and they say to him, Why do your disciples transgress the tradition of the elders? For they wash not their hands when they eat bread. Yeshua answered and said to the Pharisees, Why do you also transgress the commandment of God by your tradition? Now, when I read this, it was immediately obvious to me that there's a very sharp contrast here between the tradition of the elders and the commandment of God. The tradition of the elders... Two different ones. They contradict, right? And, uh, well, you know, they're opposing in some cases. One, one claims to be over the other by rabbinical tradition, as you'll hear in just a moment, right? But the Jews see it as one... But when we read it in the New Testament, it's actually two that appears as one in the text. Okay, we don't understand that they're talk he's talking about something else. He's not talking about the Torah, the commandment of Yah. He's talking about the traditions of the elders. Everybody follow, right? So he's not coming against the law. He's coming against the tradition of the elders. Elders and the commandment of God are two separate and distinct things, and. What Yeshua is saying is that these tradition of the elders, these takanot, these man-made laws of the Pharisees, they are a transgression of the commandment of God. And I realize that my Torah-keeping Christian friend completely missed this because he doesn't know anything about Phariseeism. He hadn't been raised with Phariseeism like I had. And so he didn't understand all these interactions and conflicts that Yeshua was having with the Pharisees. Uh, he reads about these traditions of the elders and he thinks, oh, that's the Torah. And the commandment of God, maybe that's some type of higher law. He didn't quite understand this because he didn't understand Phariseeism. And I explained to him that in order to understand all these conflicts that she was having with the Pharisees, what he really needs is a crash course in Phariseeism, which you're all about to get right now. I explained to my Torah-keeping Christian friend that the ancient name was Pharisees, and actually Pharisees comes from the Hebrew word pirushim, which means the separated ones. And at the time of the Second Temple, they were separated off from the mass of the nation. Later on, after the destruction of the temple, they began to take over more and more Jewish institutions. And today they're known, and the modern name is the Orthodox rabbis or Orthodox Jews. Now, this is something that Orthodox rabbis actually proclaim very proudly, that they're a direct continuation of the Pharisees of Second Temple, Second Temple times. And in fact, in order to be called rabbi, an Orthodox rabbi, a person must have rabbinical ordination from a previous rabbi, and that rabbi from a previous rabbi going back in an unbroken chain all the way back to the Pharisees of the first century. So the rabbis of today are literally a direct continuation, one rabbi to the next, from the Pharisees of the first century. And Phariseeism, ancient Phariseeism, and modern Orthodox Judaism are both founded upon five fundamental principles, five fundamental principles of Phariseeism, which I lovingly call the five iniquities of the Pharisees. Uh, and before we go into the first principle of Phariseeism, which is really the most foundational principle, I want to throw out a question to you. How many Torahs are there? How many Torahs? Very simple question. It's not a trick question. So, all right, how many Torahs are there? One. One Torah. But if you're a Pharisee, there are two Torahs, and that's your most fundamental doctrine and belief, that when Moses went up to Mount Sinai for 40 days and 40 nights, the Creator revealed to him two separate and distinct revelations, the written Torah and the oral Torah. The written Torah is what you were referring to, the five books of Moses. That was the Torah, the revelation that was written down. 
However, the second Torah, according to the Pharisees, which is the oral Torah, also known in English as the oral law, and they believe that God revealed to Moses this oral revelation, which was transmitted from Moses to Joshua and so on and so on, down to the Pharisees of the first century and even down to the rabbis of today. Now, everything we're going to learn today about Phariseeism is really predicated upon this concept of the oral law, the oral Torah. If we don't understand oral Torah, we're not going to understand anything else about Phariseeism. Everything else flows from that, from that concept. Now, the concept of the oral law is, uh, is really an ancient concept. The first reference to it, first datable historical reference, is an uh, incident from the era of Shammai. Shammai, many of you may have heard of Hillel. Hillel was the uh, author of the Seven Rules of Hillel. His sidekick was Shammai. And an ancient source tells us an incident with a certain Gentile that came before Shammai. Shammai uh, the Gentile said to Shammai, How many Torahs do you Pharisees have? Shammai answered, We Pharisees have two. Two Torahs, the written Torah and the oral Torah. So this is an ancient concept that goes back to approximately at least 20 before the Common Era, approximately 50 years before Yeshua's ministry, and really it probably goes back even a few hundred years before that. So this is an ancient doctrine, and really the most fundamental principle of Phariseeism is the theology or the doctrine of the two Torahs, the written Torah and the oral Torah. Now the Pharisees explain that the written Torah is sort of an outline. They often give the analogy of a, of a lecture, the notes that you're writing down right now, those notes, that's the written Torah. And the actual details, everything I'm saying, that's the oral Torah. And because of this, they, the Pharisees explain that the written Torah is completely incomprehensible without the oral Torah. The oral Torah completes the written Torah and really fills in all the details. You cannot understand the written Torah without the oral Torah, according to the Pharisees. Now, uh, Pharise the oral Torah has actually... Uh, one of the major changes in Phariseeism over the last 2,000 years is that the oral Torah has actually been written down. And today it's written down and contained in four collections of writings. The first one of these to be written down was the Mishnah, which was written down around the year 200 of the Common Era. And it contains the collection of Pharisaical traditions and teachings and practices and customs and laws. And that's really the backbone of the oral law. The next thing to be written down was the Jerusalem Talmud, which was written down around the year 350 of the Common Era. You might think it was written in Jerusalem, but in fact it was written in Tiberias. It was called Jerusalem to give it more prestige. That was written down around the year 350 of the Common Era. And uh, in the Jerusalem Talmud, it contains discussions of when the rabbis said X, Y, Z in the Mishnah, what were they talking about? And it elaborates and discusses and examines the Mishnah. The next thing to be written down is the Babylonian Talmud, which actually was written in Babylon, as, as, it named, uh, as the name implies, around the year 500 of the Common Era. Finally, the last thing to be written down was the Midrash, which was written down over many hundreds of years, from around 200 and uh, up until the year 900 of the Common Era. And these four uh, bodies of writings, these four... All right, so you guys understand what this is, right? The Mishnah, the J Jerusalem Talmud, the Babylonian Talmud, the Midrash. Um, these are some, some, some of the texts here were existed during the time of Yeshua, right? And when Nehemiah is explaining to you, have you ever heard... Or maybe you haven't, but uh, you know I've ha certainly have as as a you know someone who who tries to follow after Yeshua that trying to keep the law you're putting yourself under the burden it's impossible to keep 613 laws right this 613 you know where these laws come from these 613 most of it is the Talmud uh, but it's uh, and, and a lot of it is gleaned from the Torah which complicates things. It becomes a burden. It becomes something that men can't do, right? The Torah is not like that. The Torah is actually very simple. And, um, you know, for any given person, you're probably talking about 30 or 40 biblical laws that you got to abide by because not everything in the Torah applies to any given person. There, there are laws that, are, that apply to women and to their their monthly cycles and things like that that are in the Bible. And, you know, things that we're not supposed to do when that when when that is going on, right? And and so like these are biblical truths that are that are, you know, very good to adhere to. It's not like it's a bad thing or a burden to adhere to these things, right? Another good one is, you know, eating bacon or eating um you know, things that, that the Bible says that, are, that is bad for us. It's not that it's going to send you to hell, guys. You understand this, right? These laws are there, this dietary 
um, statutes and laws are there to protect your health is what they're there for. Right. So does it mean if you have, you know, bacon on your, now if a Jewish person gets bacon or something on their sense, they would come completely unglued. Right. Same thing for an Islamic person. But are you going to go to hell for that? Right. No, absolutely not. You know, if you eat too much, you might have a cardiac, but you're not going to go to hell for it. Right. And so we tend to take things that are, that are law and turn it into something something and, and misunderstand what is going on there. But at the time of Yeshua, he was basically dealing with, you know, the Babylonian Talmud, right? Because they had, they had just come from Babylon right before Yeshua, about 150 years. And they had this, these, these teachings of the rabbis. And that is what he was confronting in the New Testament, not the Torah. Yeshua was not bipolar. And neither was was Paul. Okay, so everybody understands that. Collections to uh, collectively are today what's known as the oral law. Even though it was originally oral in the time of Yeshua, it was still oral. Today, the oral law has been written down. And this is really the most fundamental principle of Phariseeism, the doctrine of the oral Torah. Everything else we're going to hear today about Phariseeism is predicated upon this. The second principle of Phariseeism is the absolute authority of the rabbis. The rabbis have absolute authority on earth to interpret scripture. And this is epitomized by the saying in the Midrash, which we now know is part of the oral Torah. In the Midrash it says, even if the Pharisees... Let me just clarify what this means right here. The principle number two, authority of the rabbis. These guys, in the time of Yeshua and before... Remember Gamliel? Gamliel was mentioned in, in the New Testament. Okay, And he was a Pharisee and he was... Uh, you sh um, uh, Paul said at the foot of Gamaliel, Gamaliel was, was a writer of the Talmud, an author. He was one of the rabbis writing in that, right? These guys had established rabbinic law that said, we have the authority to interpret the Torah and tell you what it means, not, not the most high, okay? First red flag right there. So, so any Christian that believes that, you know, the, the Jews might have got some things right. They got a lot wrong, okay? And this is what Yeshua was coming against. He's instructed instruct that right that is left, left or left is right. Listen to, you must to obey the absurdity them. of this. Well, what does that mean? Uh, what that means is if the, my rabbis tell me that this is my right hand, I have to obey them. By the way, it doesn't say I have to believe them. I'm allowed to even say and know that the rabbis are factually wrong, but I must obey their authority because they have the absolute authority to interpret scripture. And in fact, when I was growing up, I was told that if uh, the rabbi is wrong, the sin is upon him. But you as the individual believer cannot take the uh, initiative to question the authority of the rabbi. If your rabbi tells you this, you must accept it and follow it. Well, I really had a problem with this when I was growing up with this, and I began to study the Torah, and I began to study the Talmud, the, the oral law, and I could see in the Torah that this was clearly the word of God. In the Torah we read, and Yehovah spoken to Moses saying, and we get to the prophets and we read, thus says Yehovah. It's clearly the word of God. And we get to the Talmud and we read, Rabbi Meir says this, but Rabbi Akiva disagrees and says that. And, and, I, and I looked at this and I said, I, and I went to my rabbis and I said, look, you know, one is the word of God, the other is clearly the words of men. Shouldn't we accept the word of God over the word of men, especially since they're not consistent with each other? And my rabbi said, no, absolutely not. Although these things are spoken as the words of this rabbi or that rabbi, the actual content of their words were revealed to Moses on Mount Sinai. And I wasn't convinced, and I, and I came back and I said, look, the way the rabbis are interpreting Scripture in the oral law, the way they're interpreting the written Scripture, uh, is, is just not consistent with what it says in Scripture. And I can, I can read, and I can see that that's not what it says. And my rabbi said to me, and I, and I said to them, shouldn't we reject this oral law and just accept the written scripture? And my rabbi said to me, no, absolutely not. You mustn't say such things. That's what the Karaites say. And I said, who? And I, and I investigated and I found out throughout history there had always been Jews who only believed in the written scripture and they were called Karaites. Kara is the ancient Hebrew word for scripture. Karaite is a follower of the Old Testament or the Hebrew scriptures. And we'll talk about that a little bit more later. Incidentally, and I don't want to spoil anything, but what do you think Yeshua would have been considered? He's going to explain what that word means in just a moment. Uh, well, 
I really had a hard time with this oral law. Because most would say Christian. And one day, one of my of rabbis Greek sat word, down Christo. and he said, enough of questioning the authority of the rabbis, Nehemiah. You must accept their authority. And he began to tell me a very famous story, the story of Rabbi Eliezer, which is a foundational story in rabbinical theology. And the story of Rabbi Eliezer, it's told in the Babylonian Talmud, and it goes as follows. Rabbi Eliezer was the greatest of the sages of his era. He was actually the teacher of Rabbi Akiva, who's maybe one of the most famous rabbis that ever lived. So you can imagine how great Rabbi Eliezer was. And one day, Rabbi Eliezer is in the rabbinical academy, and he's having a debate with all the other rabbis and some minutia of rabbinical law about whether a certain type of oven is ritually clean or ritually unclean. And Rabbi Eliezer says that oven is ritually clean, and all the other rabbis say it's ritually unclean. And Rabbi Eliezer is trying to convince the other rabbis he's right. He's one, and he's against the, this mass of other rabbis. And the Talmud explains that on that day, Rabbi Eliezer brought forth every argument in the world, and he couldn't convince the other rabbis that he was right. Couldn't convince him he was right. He brought forth scriptural arguments and rational arguments, and he couldn't convince them he was right. He doesn't know what to do. He's getting very frustrated. And finally, he says, I know what I can do to convince them. I'm going to invoke a miracle. And Rabbi Eliezer shouts out, and he says, If I'm right, let the trees prove it. And at that moment, they heard the snapping of wood, and all the rabbis ran outside, as the, and they saw an entire orchard of trees being ripped from the roots and flying up in the air, and they looked at this and they said, this is a miraculous occurrence. Rabbi Eliezer has invoked a miracle to prove he's right, and the miracle has come to pass. And they look at this miracle, and they turn to Rabbi Eliezer, and they say, uh, sorry, Rabbi Eliezer, we don't listen to trees. <laughs> oh boy, what, what's he going to do? <laughs> you don't listen to trees, I just brought a miracle! So he says, okay, may, maybe we're not quite understanding each other here. And he says, let's try this again. I'm going to invoke a second miracle. If I'm right, let the river prove it. And at that moment, they heard the rushing of the water. It was a very great river. <laughs> and they run outside, and they see this mighty river begin to flow backwards. And they look at this, and they say, this is a miracle. A second miracle has now been invoked that Rabbi Eliezer has brought to prove he's right. We're very impressed. And they turn to Rabbi Eliezer and they say, Sorry, Rabbi Eliezer, we don't listen to rivers. He's brought two miracles and they're not listening to what he's saying. He's brought scriptural arguments and rational arguments and two miracles and they won't listen to him. So finally, in desperation, he yells out and he says, If I'm right, let the walls of the academy prove it. And at that moment, they heard the walls begin to shake and rumble. And the Talmud explains... The Talmud explains that the walls came to a 45 degree angle, collapsing in. Of course, if they had fallen in the entire way, the story would have ended right here. And the rabbis look at these walls and realize they've almost been killed by these falling walls. And they turn to Rabbi Eliezer and they say, wow, three miracles. Now we're really impressed. This can't be a coincidence. This is clearly a series of miraculous events. They turn to Rabbi Eliezer and say, sorry, Rabbi Eliezer, we don't listen to walls. He doesn't know what to do. Three miracles, and they won't accept his opinion. They won't accept these proofs that he's right. And finally, in utter desperation, he calls out and he says, If I'm right, let heaven prove it. And at that moment, they heard the crack of thunder, followed by a voice. Why do you dispute with Rabbi Eliezer? In all matters, the law agrees with him. And by the way, that's an actual recording that was made at the time. <laughs> They've heard this voice calling out from heaven, saying, Rabbi Eliezer's right, why are you arguing with him? And they hear this, and they're very impressed, and they turn to Rabbi Eliezer, and they say, scriptural evidence, and mir three miracles, and God calling down from us from heaven, telling us you're right. And they turn to him and say, we're very impressed, but sorry, we don't listen to heaven. Think about that. Because the same is true in, in, in Christian denominations. Right, we can find the same kind of thing with with people, where where Yah's he's speaking very profoundly on a truth, and people won't accept it. It's called cognitive dissonance in in psychology, but um, that's kind of his point here, right? When truth is staring you in the face, and you're still like, no, nah, no, nah. I I can say the same is true, but with these codes. There have been people who have followed my channel, and as long as it, is it agreed with their agenda, everything is good. But anytime a code disproved what they believed or 
you know, confronted them or something like that, throw the hands up and it's, it's all over from that point. Right. And this is what I'm trying to prevent in you guys, because you, you're never going to get over that mountain and discover the truth. If you, if you're that person, you got to You got to endure to the end digging and going down those rabbit holes as painful as it is. And let me tell you something, when you have to deconstruct some of the, some of the things that you've been indoctrinated with, guess what? It's like ripping a bandaid off. It's a little bit painful. Okay. And you just got to get through it. Right. So that's kind of the, the point of this. This is what happened to, to Nehemiah from his perspective, from a Jewish perspective. And guess what? He got drawn to Yeshua. And I'm believing miracles for this brother. That, that he's eventually going to see that Yeshua is the Messiah, right? He already trusts him as a rabbi and a, and a teacher and agrees with everything that he taught, right? So he's right there, right? It's an amazing journey, this guy. But the same thing, we have the same, we have to look at this with the two sides of the stick. The same thing's going to happen. And there's an identity crisis and, an, and, and misunderstanding of, of scripture with a lot of people. And, and, and they're going to get to the point where they're starting to figure things out, right? We got to get the fundamentals down. And as my rabbi was telling me this story, he opened up actually me to the book of Deuteronomy, to Deuteronomy chapter 30, verse 12. And there it actually says concerning the Torah that the Torah is not in heaven. It is not in heaven. And this is the words that the rabbis said to Rabbi Eliezer. All right, so this is one verse. Look, look Christians do the same thing. We'll take, we'll take fragments of scripture and take it out of context and interpret it. Listen how the rabbis interpret the scripture, because it's this scripture that gives them the authority to override the Torah with the Talmud. And they explained to him that God has no say in interpreting scripture because the Torah is not in heaven. The Torah is here on earth, and the rabbis are the ones who have exclusive authority to interpret scripture. God has no say in it. And my rabbi turned to me as he was telling me the story, and he said, You see, Nehemiah, God himself can't question the interpretation of the rabbis. So who are you to question their interpretation? And as I was hearing this, I, I, I was in shock. And I have to tell you, for years I struggled with the oral law. Uh, it was very difficult for me because uh, my father was a rabbi, and many of my ancestors were prominent rabbis. The man after whom I'm named, Nehemiah, was a famous rabbi in Chicago. And for me to, to break from this oral law, which had been the heritage of my ancestors, was very difficult for me. And for years I struggled with this, and I had doubts, and I wasn't sure. And, but when I heard the story, I turned to my rabbi, and I thanked him, and I said, Now I know this is not of God. Now the story actually has a continuation. It gets worse. Uh, the Talmud goes on. My rabbi didn't tell me this part, but later I read this directly out of the Talmud. And it tells about how... Later on, after the face-off between Rabbi Eliezer and the other rabbis, one of the rabbis named Rabbi Natan was wandering through the forest, and who does he meet in the forest? He meets the prophet Elijah. And of course, the rabbis believe that Elijah never died. If you've ever been to a rabbinical Passover Seder, one of the things that you'll notice very prominently, they'll stop in the middle of telling the story of the Exodus, and they'll open up the door to let Elijah in. Uh, well, Rabbi Natan, according to the Talmud, actually met Elijah, and he said to him, Elijah... When we said to God that the Torah is not in heaven, and by the way, if you look at that passage where it says it is not in heaven, and you read two verses earlier, what it's actually saying in the context is, the Torah is not too difficult for you. It's saying there you have no excuse not to keep the Torah. It's not too difficult. It's not across the sea or in heaven that you have some excuse to say, I need someone to go up to heaven to get it for me. The Torah is not too difficult. That's what it actually says in Deuteronomy 30. But the rabbis only take those five words out of context. And Rabbi Natan asks Elijah, what did God mean when, what, what, did, what was God's reaction when we said the Torah is not in heaven? And Elijah explains, according to the Talmud, that at that moment God laughed and said, My sons have defeated me. My sons have defeated me. And this is, appears in the Babylonian Talmud, the Tractate of Baba Matziah, page 59b. And the point of the story is, I, I don't believe that God actually said those words, as the Talmud claims. But the point of the story in the Talmud is whether the words were said or not, is that the rabbis have vanquished God, that the rabbis have absolute authority on earth to interpret scripture, and the rabbis have defeated God in the sense he has no say in how scripture is to be interpreted on planet earth. In heaven he can say whatever he wants, but down here on earth the rabbis have absolute authority. And this is a fundamental principle of Phariseeism. 
that you really can't understand Phariseeism without understanding this concept. Now, we're beginning to see a problem here because in Matthew 23, Yeshua seems to be upholding this concept. He's saying the Pharisees sit in the seat of Moses. They have Mosaic authority. Whatsoever they bid you observe, that observe and do. Whatever they command you to do, you better do it. Uh, which, you know, what's going on here? Well, the third principle of Phariseeism is what I call irrational interpretation. The rabbis don't call it that. They call it midrashic interpretation. This is sometimes translated into English as homiletical or hermeneutical interpretation. And what it does is it systematically ignores the language and context of Scripture. And the principle behind this method of interpretation or this approach is that Scripture is a divine code. Ignores the language and ignores the context, folks. Can, okay, so let's just say we're trying to use a compass to find our way through the jungle. Let's say we ignore some things in that process. Are we going to find our way? Absolutely not. <laughs> this is absurd. But the midrashic interpretation is they ignore the language, they ignore the context, and they give their own interpretation, right? And the Bible says the the word is not open to man's interpretation. It, it interprets itself. And that's what I'm trying to show you guys with these codes, that the, the encoded text is actually interprets itself for, for whatever doctrine. And, and this is separate from anything that was, is, and will be. You follow what I'm saying? So the Bible interprets itself as one facet of these codes, but also this, the hidden and secret things of Yah, like, you know, what we've been looking at with the election and things like that. That's not doctrine and things like that, but yet it's hidden in a lot of places like the, the prophets who are speaking to an, a time and telling you something that's going to happen. And so when we see a correlation with one of these codes that are, that's about an event that's probable— Right, we can we can say with some certainty that it's probable. Right, ignores language, ignores context. The same thing happens in Christianity, you guys. And only the rabbis have the knowledge and authority and tools to decipher that divine code. And we've already. By the way, this was one of the original things of the Catholic Church was uh, you guys didn't have the the capacity to, to read your own Bible. Okay, so the Catholic Church had the Bible, and it was against the law for you to possess that, and they told you what it said, okay? So it's the same thing that would happen uh, on the other side. The enemy comes to steal, kill, and destroy. I've already seen an example of that with the words, it is not in heaven, from Deuteronomy 30. The rabbis took only those words, it is not in heaven, out of the context, disembodied them from the context, and imbued them with the meaning that was never intended, that God has no authority in how to interpret Scripture. Now let's look at another example, a classic example of Midrashic interpretation or rational interpretation. Exodus 23, verse 2. There we read in the Torah, You shall not go after the majority to do evil, neither shall you testify in a matter of strife to incline after the majority to pervert justice. And what this means is that you must not follow what the majority says just because the majority says it. You must follow the truth, even if you're the only one doing that. And if you're testifying in a court case, you must not say that a certain person is guilty just because everybody says he's guilty. You must testify the truth even if you're the lone voice of reason because to do otherwise would be a perversion of justice. Now, this is a very, very important commandment in the Torah that we must follow the truth and not the majority, not to be sheeple, follow after the herd. But the rabbis take this verse and, of course, they have the absolute authority on earth to interpret scripture and using this authority... Scripture being a divine code, they arbitrarily take off words from the beginning and words from the end, and what they're left with is the principle, incline after the majority. And in fact, this is a very important principle in Phariseeism, when there was this debate between Rabbi Eliezer and the rabbis. Why was it so important for Rabbi Eliezer to convince the other rabbis that he was right? Why couldn't he just say, I'm a very wise man, you're very wise men, let's agree to disagree. Why, why did he have to invoke miracles and have God, God calling out from heaven? Why couldn't they just agree to disagree? Because the rabbis said to Rabbi Eliezer that you must incline after the majority. They said to him in Exodus 23, 2, it has already been written that you must incline after the majority. We're the majority, you have to accept our opinion. That's why it was so important for him to convince them. If he can't convince them, he has to accept this opinion that he knows to be factually untrue. Now, what's wrong with this? Who's to say scripture's not a divine code? That's I just I just want to point out something here, you guys. Do you see what they just did? 
what the rabbis did with that. They butchered, literally butchered this, this uh, verse right here and turn it into something that they wanted. This has happened over and over again and has bled over to Catholicism and then down to Protestantism and on downstream to wherever Yah found us. And so we've consumed a lot of poison, in other words. If this was, if this was a river, imagine if this was a river, right? And we're way downstream ahead of all of this other stuff. Right, all this confusion, all this butchering, and things that happen with theologians and rabbis and all of these people. Right? Yah's merciful and he's gonna bring us to the truth, right? He's gonna especially in the end times where he reveals all things. That's by the way, that's what the word apocryph, you know, the, the apocalypse means, the revealing, the unveiling of, of the truth, right? And so, back to my point, we got to come to a point where we're willing to lay down some things that we've inherited. The Bible says that the Gentiles will once say that we inherited lies and falsehoods from our fathers, right? That's what the rabbis would respond. They'd say, okay, we're taking these words out of context, but that's the original intent that God have, had when he gave the Torah. Who's to say scripture's not a divine code? Well, I know scripture is not a divine code because it tells us in Deuteronomy exactly how to interpret scripture. Deuteronomy chapter 31 verse 12, it describes there a commandment that the Torah must be read out loud in a public reading. And there we're told, gather the nation, the men, the women, the children, and the sojourner in your gate, in order that they hear, and in order that they learn, and fear Jehovah your God, and diligently do all the words of this Torah. And the purpose of this public reading every seventh year of the entire Torah from Genesis to the end of Deuteronomy is so that Israelites would hear the Torah. By hearing the Torah, they would learn the Torah. And by learning the Torah, they would know to do the Torah. Now it goes on in verse 13 and it explains, uh, And their children who did not know that seven-year-old boy who's never heard the Torah before. It's his first time. Their children who did not know, they shall hear and learn to fear Jehovah your God. Now, this is very important because what this means is that the way the ancient Israelites learned Torah was by hearing it. And actually, this is the way that God intended that the Torah be understood. By coming every seventh year and hearing it in the public reading, someone who's never heard Torah before, someone who does not know, will simply learn it by hearing it. Now, once we realize that, we realize that you can't take five words out of context. It is not in heaven because when I'm hearing it, I'm hearing the entire passage. I'm hearing the entire verse. I can't take two verses here and three words there and half a verse here and proof text myself into an entire theology. I have to actually read scripture within its context and look at all the evidence and all the context, not just taking a few words here and a few words there. Because that's what the ancient Israelites would have understood and heard when they heard the Torah read out loud every seventh year. Now why is it that they had to hear the Torah? Why couldn't they simply sit in their houses and read Torah like we do today? Why did they have to actually hear it out loud and come all the way to Jerusalem every seventh year? Well, the reason for that is that the average, the ancient Israelites, uh, the average ancient Israelite did not have a copy of the Torah in his house. It took great wealth and resources to have a copy of the Torah in your house. And in fact, there's a specific law in Deuteronomy 17 that the Messiah anointed king of Israel must write for himself a copy of the Torah. And the reason he must write for himself a copy of the Torah is that if he doesn't write for himself a copy of the Torah, he won't have one. He can't go to the store and buy one for $3. If he doesn't write it out letter for letter, word for word, he simply won't have one. And if he doesn't have one, he can't reign as a righteous king. As a righteous king of Israel, he has to have the Torah at his side at all times. And that's why Deuteronomy 17 is a specific law commanding the king to write a copy of the Torah. Now, Again, why was, did it take such great resources to make a copy of the Torah? Let's remember in ancient times, if I wanted a copy of the Torah, I had to have, I had to start off with an entire flock of sheep that I could slaughter in order to make parchment. Not everybody could afford to do this. I had to have barrels and barrels of ink in order to actually write the Torah. And bear in mind, you, don't go, you couldn't go in ancient times to Office Depot and say, I need 30 barrels of ink. You had to actually have someone go out and produce the ink and produce the barrels. This was a whole industry just to write one book. And finally, maybe the most expensive part is you had to have a scribe sit for at least a year and sit and copy letter for letter, word for word, in order to have a copy of the Torah for yourself. So the average Israelite simply did not have a copy of the Torah. 
he didn't have access, didn't have the wealth or the resources to produce a copy of the Torah. And the, to- and, and the Creator knew this, and that's why he took into account and said that the way the I- average Israelites will learn Torah, the simple shepherd and farmer, is by simply hearing it every seventh year. Now, once we realize this, we realize that the way Scripture is intended to be understood is by looking at the language and the context. And that's key to understanding the correct interpretation of Scripture, looking at the language and the context. Now, this is actually a big challenge for us. We can't just show up every seventh year and hear it because we have certain challenges that ancient Israelites did not have. First challenge we have is a linguistic challenge, the language. The Torah is not written in King James English. It's actually written in Biblical Hebrew. Now, the problem is that nobody today in the world speaks Biblical Hebrew. I've lived in Israel for 12 years and I'm fluent in modern Hebrew, and I actually read Biblical Hebrew fluently, but nobody speaks Biblical Hebrew as their native tongue. Now, to give you an idea of what the difference is, uh, it's like the difference between the English you speak here today and the English of Chaucer. You could pick up the writings of Chaucer and you probably would understand a few words on each page, but unless you're specifically trained to read that dialect of English, you won't understand what Chaucer is saying. And that's the challenge we have with Biblical Hebrew. We have to understand the language as it was originally spoken 3,500 years ago. The language that was spoken by the ancient Israelite shepherds and farmers that could simply show up and hear the Torah, read and understand it. So we have to work a lot harder than they did. Uh, and that's part of what it means to be in exile, to be thrown out of the land of Israel. Do you guys happen to, here's a pop quiz. Do you guys know what that language is? Does anybody know what that is? It's not modern Hebrew. What What is biblical Hebrew? Does anybody know? Anybody? You can put it in the chat if you don't want to answer. Come on, you guys. Aramaic, that's right. Is exactly what it is. And Aramaic and, um, you know, what we see with um, some Arabs and what they speak, um, there's ver- there's similarities, both Semitic languages, right? But Aramaic, uh, basically what you see in, in the Passion of the Christ, it's a little bit different than the modern day Hebrew, which has a, a very thick Hasidic and um, uh, Germanic uh, influence on Anyway, yeah, it's Aramaic. Very good, Leanna. We all lose our language, be scattered throughout the world. This is, these are the things that we have to deal with being in exile. Now, this next thing we have to look at is the context. And we've already talked about textual context. That is, I can't just take the words, it is not in heaven, and disembody them from the context. I have to look at the entire passage, or I'm, or I'm twisting what Scripture says. And there's also a historical context. Let me illustrate what I mean by this uh, historical context by uh, an example. Three times in the Torah were commanded, Lo tevashel gedi bachalevimo. You shall not boil a kid in its mother's milk. Three times that appears, word for word, jot for jot, tittle for tittle, the exact same commandment three times. Three times. Now, the rabbis, of course, look upon Scripture as a divine code, and when they hear three times, Exodus 23, you shall not boil a kid in its mother's milk. Exodus 34, you shall not boil a kid in its mother's milk. Deuteronomy 14, you shall not boil a kid in its mother's milk. They hear that three times, and they say Scripture is a divine code. And when codes have repeated things, they, they, it, it's to encode extra hidden meaning. And th- when it appears the same commandment three times, that actually indicates that uh, three different things. And what are the three different things this indicates? The fir- of course, only the rabbis have the authority to interpret what these three things are. The first one, according to the rabbis, is you shall not eat meat and milk together. The second time it says you shall not boil a kid in its mother's milk, what it really means is you shall not cook meat and milk together. And the third time it appears, it means you shall not even benefit from meat and milk cooked together. What do they mean by benefit? You may not even feed it to your dog. Well, that's how the Pharisees, the rabbis, look at it. When I hear three times that the Creator tells me you shall not boil a kid in its mother's milk, I first asked the question, what would the ancient Israelite shepherd or farmer have understood if he heard these exact words repeated three times? If he, did, if he was that boy, that seven-year-old boy who knew nothing, Deuteronomy 31 verse 13, he didn't know anything, what would he have understood? And I come to the conclusion after a linguistic and textual analysis that what, what I would understand from hearing this three times is, you shall not boil a kid in his mother's milk! It's very clear! It has nothing to do with meat and milk. Now, today we know that's correct. We know that's the correct interpretation because archaeologists have uncovered ancient, uh, ancient documents written by the Canaanites from a city in Syria called Ras Shamra, which has ancient Canaanite writings. And there the Canaanites talk about how they have a fertility rite 
where they would boil a kid in the milk of its mother as a fertility rite for one of their goddesses. And so today we know that the reason the Torah forbade us from partaking in this pagan practice or forbade us from boiling a kid in the milk of its mother is that this was an ancient pagan fertility custom or sacrifice. And that's why the Torah doesn't say, don't eat meat and milk together or don't boil meat and milk together because it's not talking about that. It's talking about a very specific pagan fertility sacrifice of boiling a kid in the milk of its mother. It's not even a dietary law. It's a pagan sacrifice we're forbidden from partaking in. And every ancient Israelite shepherd or farmer would have known this. They interacted with the Canaanites, and they knew these pagans. They knew their ways, and they knew that they were, that they were sacrificing kids in the milk of their mothers, and the Torah is coming to forbid them from doing that. <clears throat> And th that's the difference between interpreting Scripture as a divine code and interpreting Scripture actually in its context according to its language and according to its historical context. And what, what this teaches us is that we have to use archaeology and history in order to uncover and try to get a better picture and understanding of what the Torah is commanding us. Now, that's the third principle of Phariseeism. The fourth principle of Phariseeism is sanctified tradition. And in Hebrew this is called minhag or custom. And there's a principle in Phariseeism, Minhag Yisrael Torahi, a custom of Israel is law. And what that means is that a custom done over and over by an, by an Israelite or Jewish community over time becomes sanctified and it becomes an actual law. So I mentioned today that I'm dressed as a modern day Pharisee. I don't actually dress normally this way. I'm dressed in the garb of a modern day Pharisee to illustrate to you what it would mean to obey the Pharisees. And this is actually a sanctified outfit, uh, a tradition that's been sanctified over time. And if you go to Jerusalem or New York or certain parts of Chicago, you'll pe see people all over dressed like this because they're following the sanctified tradition of their ancestors. Now, what do we mean by a sanctified tradition? Uh, or the classic example of a sanctified tradition is wearing the head covering. And right now I'm going to illustrate to you what it would mean not to follow the traditions of the Pharisees, the sanctified traditions. We're going to peel away some of these man-made laws, some of these sanctified traditions. I'm going to take off the hat. All right, so he's going to point out something really ironic here because I've been in this discussion with another Hebrew teacher online who wears, you know, a head covering, a kippah. And by the way, I don't wear a head covering because of any rabbinical law. This is strictly vanity reasons. <laughs> it has nothing to do with it. It's, it's my hair thins. Anyway, he goes into talking about this, but there, there's another one that I want to mention, and, and this this notion of counting the omer when it comes around time for uh, Shavuot. Um, you see a lot of messianics and even some Christians who who kind of jump on the bandwagon of doing that, um, and that's not in the Torah at all. That is a rabbinic tradition. It, it's, it comes from the Talmud. He's about to share one with you really right here. It's very profound because, you know, when I first crossed over, and, and, you know, was trying to, you know, uh, be a Hebrew and follow after Yeshua. And that's what I mean by that. Not Jewish. But at the time, I thought it meant Jewish. And I was wearing a kippah. And then I came to the understanding of what Torah was and what Talmud was and where, you know, some of these things were coming from. So I shed that. I let it go. But you'll still see Messianics who, who hold to, the, to that. And they're basically wearing a costume. And uh, ironically... I've been called a Pharisee by the very one wearing a kippah from a Pharisaical law, which is hilarious to me. It kind of shows the foolishness of some people's understanding. But uh, he goes into that right here. If you ever see the Jews and, and wearing the kippah, here's where it comes from. It does not come from the Torah. Because this is a traditional Pharisee hat. I'm going to take off the hat and peel away a layer of tradition. And now I'm left wearing the kippah, the skull cap. And the kippah is a tradition that's been sanctified over the last approximately 800 years. A thousand years ago, there was no such thing as Jews wearing kippahs. It didn't exist. There was no, no such custom like that. Approximately over the eight, last 800 years, this custom has been sanctified over time. And today it's been so sanctified that there's an actual law uh, that, with its own rules and regulations that, a Pharisee, that the Pharisees teach that you must wear the skull cap if you're a male. And this is described in the Shulchan Aruch, which we've seen before as the modern, universally accepted guide to pharisaical living. And there it says about the keep of the skull cap, one may not walk four cubits with an uncovered head. So this is not just a folk custom, oh, I feel Jewish if I wear a kippah. No, 
If you wear the kippah, you're following this man-made law that's been sanctified over time and now is taking on its own rules and regulations. One may not walk a four cubits with an uncovered head. Let's see how that would work. So I'm going to take off my kippah, peel away another layer of tradition, and we're going to see what this means. Okay, so if I'm following this sanctified tradition, I can walk one cubit, and I can walk a second cubit, and a third cubit, and if I walk that fourth cubit, then I am violating the laws of the Pharisees, this sanctified tradition. Uh, there's another law there in the Shulchan Aruch concerning the head covering, and there it says, it is forbidden to pray with an uncovered head. Well, that's very interesting, and I think that that matter speaks for itself. Uh, but what you can see here is this is not just a folk customer tradition, this is something that has been sanctified over time, and now is taken on its own rules and regulations. Well, what's wrong with that? Many people will say, well, it makes me feel good to wear a kippah. It makes me feel more Jewish, not just to wear the kippah, the skull cap, but to follow all these different traditions, even if I'm not Jewish by extraction. I feel good following these, these traditions. It makes me feel closer to the, um, to the ancient roots. What's wrong with that? What's wrong with adding new commandments, with sanctifying these traditions? What's wrong with it is that the Torah specifically forbids us from doing this. In Deuteronomy chapter 4, verse 2, it says, You shall not add unto the matter which I command you today, nor shall you diminish anything from it, to keep the commandments of Jehovah your God which I am commanding you. There's a specific prohibition in the Torah from adding to the Torah. So if we add these man-made laws, if we follow these sanctified traditions, we are partaking in adding to the Torah. Now it's very interesting here, because in the same breath that it forbids us from adding to the Torah, it forbids us from taking away from the Torah. So to follow one of these sanctified traditions is no different than abolishing the Sabbath, adding the Torah, taking away. Those are both a violation of this fundamental law in the Torah of adding or taking away from the Torah. Now, this appears a second time. There's a second witness to this. Deuteronomy 12.32, All that I am commanding you shall diligently do. You shall not add to it or diminish from it. You must not add to the Torah or take away from the Torah. And the question becomes, if you, follow, if you follow these man-made laws, these sanctified traditions, who are you, who are you uh, obeying? Who are you being obedient to? Are you being obedient to our Creator? Or are you following these man-made laws which are in addition to the Torah? This appears a third time. Proverbs 30, verse 6. There we're told, Do not add unto his words, lest he reprove you, and you be found a liar. I don't want, call, I don't want God calling me a liar. I don't want any part of that. Well, the fifth principle of Phariseeism is very similar to number four. And the fifth principle is the commandments of men, or enactments in Hebrew, the takanot. The takanot, that's the fifth, fifth principle of Phariseeism. Has anybody heard that word before, takanot? Is that familiar from anywhere? Yes? Okay, so let's everyone all say that together. Takanot! Okay, so takanot, these man-made laws. And these are actually called by the rabbis. They use another term for this. Mitzvot de Rabbanan, commandments of our rabbis. And the rabbis actually make a very clear distinction between laws that they derive from the Torah, albeit using their irrational methods of, inter of interpretation, and laws that they derive uh, simply by either tradition or by a rabbinical enactment. And the truth is that sometimes they can't distinguish between whether a certain law was established by tradition, by doing it over and over, or whether it was established by an actual the rabbi sitting down and making a new enactment. Uh, and so really those are very related and similar categories. But there's a very clear distinction between that and laws derived from the Torah, even using the rational methods of interpretation. Now, the classic example of takanot, or commandments of our rabbis, is the washing of the hands. And because the oral law gives the rabbis the ex absolute authority to make these new enactments, they have a divine, God-given right to make new enactments. Because of that, you make the blessing, Blessed out the Lord, King of the universe, who has sanctified us with his commandments commanding us to wash the hands. The rabbis know very well that God never commanded them to wash the hands, but what they mean by this is that God commanded you to obey the rabbis. By obeying the rabbis, you're indirectly obeying God. And this is very interesting. What this means is every time you sit down to eat a meal and wash your hands, you're actually proclaiming the God-given authority of the rabbis to make these enactments. Now how many people are thinking here, I'm not going to do these rabbinical enactments. They're not from the Torah. How many people are thinking that? Okay, we got a good group of Pharisees here. Most people are. Okay, how many people are thinking you're not going to follow these man-made laws because they're not from the Torah? Okay, that's much better. Now, this is what the oral law says to everyone who raised their hands. It says in the Midrash, which is part of the oral law, it says, A person must not say, I will not keep the commandment of the elders because they're not from the Torah. You must not say that. 
The Almighty says to such a person, now they're putting, literally putting words in God's mouth, the Almighty says to such a person, No, my son, rather all that they decree upon you observe. And then it goes on, and it, now it quotes Deuteronomy 17.11, As it is written, according the, to the instruction which they teach you. Now you could look up in Deuteronomy 17, and it's not talking about the Pharisees or rabbis. You won't see them mentioned anywhere. What it's actually talking about is the high priest at the temple and the prophetic judge. And what it talks about there is if, the, if there's a difficult court case and the lower judges, remember Moses came along and he uh, appointed lower judges and lower judges above, below them because he couldn't handle uh, judging all, every matter by himself. So what it's describing in Deuteronomy 17 is if one of those lower judges comes along and says, I don't know what the law is here, or this is a difficult case, I don't know what to do, then he goes to the high judge at the temple, or, or to, the, to the high priest at the temple. This is not talking about the Pharisees or the rabbis. And actually in the various passages, such as in Ezra chapter 2, verse 63, it talks about an actual case they had like this. And it says there that this had to be decided by the high priest with the Urim and the Thummim, or in Hebrew the Urim and the Thummim, which was a prophetic device that the high judge would go and ask, what is the answer he would ask from God? He wouldn't just make it up. Because God actually does have a say in how Scripture is interpreted. But the rabbis apply this to themselves because to them God has no say, only they have a say. And then it goes on in the Midrash and it says, remember God is speaking here, the Almighty. And it goes on there and it says, even I must obey their decree. Even I, God, must obey the decrees of the rabbis. And by the way, it quotes a verse there from Job which has nothing to do whatsoever with the authority of the rabbis or God obeying them. But the principle here is that the rabbis are given absolute authority not only to interpret Scripture, but to make new enactments, and God himself must obey those enactments according to the oral law. Well, now that we understand Phariseeism, let's get an overview. We see these five principles of Phariseeism, and the first principle is the concept of the two Torahs, the written Torah and the oral Torah. Then we have the authority of the rabbis, the absolute authority of the rabbis to interpret Scripture. God has no say in it, only the rabbis do irrational or midrashic interpretation. Scripture is a divine code and things can be taken out of context. Uh, sanctified tradition, such as the kippah and the takanot or commandments of men, such as the washing of the hands. Now it was very interesting. I was giving this talk uh, about a week ago and afterwards a woman walked up to me and she said, Nehemiah, when you were talking about the five principles of Phariseeism, you didn't really mean the Pharisees. You really meant my denomination of Christianity, right? And I said to her, you know, I mean, I'm talking about what I, what I know from my first-hand experience. I don't really know anything about your denomination of Christianity. But if the shoe fits, just make sure to put on the right shoe first. Uh, oh, oh. Don't tie it. Okay. Now, now that we understand Phariseeism, what we need to do is go back to Matthew 15 and see if we can understand what's happening. The Pharisees come along and say to Yeshua, your disciples are transgressing the tradition of the elders because they don't wash their hands before they eat, which is that ritual we saw before. What is exactly going on there? There in verse 3, Yeshua says to the Pharisees, why do you also transgress the commandment of God by your tradition? So how do the Pharisees transgress the commandment of God by their tradition? How is, that, how is the Pharisee tradition a transgression of the commandment of God? They're adding to the Torah! Deuteronomy 4.2, Deuteronomy 12.32, and Proverbs 30, verse 6, forbid us to add to the Torah. And by adding these laws to the Torah, this commandment to wash the hands, it's a transgression of the commandment of God. Yeshua goes on in verse 6, and he says to the Pharisees, Thus have you made the commandment of God of none effect by your tradition. How did the Pharisees make the commandment of God of none effect? This is something that I see every day in modern day Israel. I see it all the time. One of the things that most people are surprised at when they come to Israel for the first time is that most Jews in Israel do not observe the Sabbath. Most people, when they come to Israel, are shocked to see that. And if you ask the average Israeli, why don't you keep the Sabbath? He'll respond and tell you, it's impossible to keep the Sabbath. And I, I respond, okay, I've been keeping the Sabbath my whole life. And why is it impossible? And he'll tell you, well, if I keep the Sabbath, I have to do this and I have to do that. And I can't do this and I can't do that. And every single thing he lists is something, these man-made traditions and laws that the Pharisees have foisted upon the nation, these heavy burdens they've loaded up upon the nation, and the average person can't always distinguish between what has the Creator commanded us and what are these man-made laws that the Pharisees have commanded. And because of that, they just completely give up and say, okay, I just can't do it. They give up, and by requiring these man-made laws, the Pharisees have made the commandment of God, of God of none effect. They've made it impossible to keep the Torah. 
Now, I, I've been keeping the Sabbath my whole life, and I know from firsthand experience that it's a pleasure to keep the Sabbath. The Sabbath is a delight. It's only when you add all these man-made laws and rules and regulations, then it becomes impossible to keep and it becomes a burden. And this is how the Pharisees make the commandment of God of none effect. Well, what we can see here very clearly in Matthew 15 is Yeshua is warning his disciples not to follow the man-made laws of the Pharisees. You must not follow the man-made laws. He goes on in verse 7. This is a very interesting passage. And he says, You hypocrites, speaking to the Pharisees, You hypocrites, well did Isaiah prophesy of you saying. And now he quotes Isaiah 29 verse 13. This people draws near unto me with their mouth and honors me with their lips, but their heart is far from me. But in vain do they worship me, teaching for doctrines the commandments of men. Well, now we know what he's talking about, teaching for doctrines the commandments of men. That is Phariseeism with their oral law and their man-made authority. I would, I would uh, also submit, you guys, this is a main reason why we see what Yeshua says in, in Matthew, uh, you know, or Matthew 7, where he's, he's saying, depart from me, right? Because it, they're, they're, they're doctrines of men. And they're, they're completely deceived. They think they're doing the work of the Most High, and Yeshua doesn't even know them, right? Which ties into the parable of the ten virgins, by the way, uh, which is, you know, um, he starts to talk about, you know, something really interesting in just a moment. We're going to wrap up at the one hour mark on this video. But he starts talking about something uh, about Hebrewisms and, you know, root words and things like that. And, and, um, how they're apparently, I don't want to spoil it for you, but it's it's very fascinating. And, it, and this kind of understanding can help you interpret the Bible when you have that level of understanding of what these words mean. To interpret scripture even above that of God and their takanot and their, uh, their sanctified traditions, that's teaching for doctrines, the commandments of men. Now, when I saw this, for, when, I, when I first read this, I was very intrigued for a different reason that you're so intrigued by it. And I was intrigued by this because uh, Matthew 15.9 is actually a paraphrase of Isaiah 29.13. Isaiah 29.13 actually speaks about, in Hebrew, mitzvat anashim lumada, which is translated variously as a learned commandment of men or a commandment of men learned by rote or some variation of, of that translation. And the reason I was so intrigued by this is that I knew that throughout history, Karaite Jews, strictly Old Testament Tanakh following Jews, have always quoted this verses from the moment that Phariseeism was invented, have always quoted Isaiah 29, 13 in reference to the Pharisees. And I thought this was very interesting that Yeshua was applying the same exact verse to the Pharisees back in the first century. And back when I was sitting with my Torah-keeping Christian friend, I said to him, almost thinking out loud, I said, you know, Yeshua really sounds to me like a Karaite. And... And uh, I asked him what he thought of that. And at first he was very offended and he said, No, Karaites, that's some Jewish sect from the Middle Ages. And Yeshua wasn't part of that and you're trying to take him over. And I, and I could see he didn't really understand what, what this Hebrew word Karaite meant. And so I explained to him that actually the word Karaite comes from the Hebrew word kara, which is the ancient Hebrew word for the Hebrew Scriptures or Old Testament. And many of you may know the modern Hebrew word Tanakh. Tanakh is an acronym which stands for the Law of the Prophets and the Writings. And that's a word that's only been used in the last few hundred years. How, the, the ancient Hebrew word for scripture is kara, and the variation of that is mikra, which is still used today in Israel. Kara or mikra. And if uh, kara, meaning Hebrew scriptures, someone who follows the Hebrew scriptures is called a karaite or a karaite. Kara is Hebrew scriptures or Old Testament. A follower of the Old Testament is a karaite. Now, Earlier I explained to you that as a Karaite, I only believe in the Old Testament. And you probably thought, don't all Jews just believe in the Old Testament? Now you know that, that many Jews today actually believe in the Oral Torah. And when I say I'm a Karaite, that means I only believe in the Hebrew Scriptures, the Tanakh, the Kara, the Old Testament, and not in the Oral Torah of, that the Pharisees have invented. Now the term Karaite was used throughout history very often to distinguish those that followed the Hebrew Scriptures from the Talmudists, who, uh, that is, the rabbis or the Pharisees, the Talmudists, once the Talmud was written down, in the, around the year 500 of the Common Era, it began to be disseminated throughout the Jewish world, and many Jews embraced it and declared that they were followers of Talmud, Talmudists, and other Jews said, Talmud, oral law, what's that? Our ancestors only knew about Kara, we are Karaites. And that's what the, the term means. And when I said that Yeshua sounded like a Karaite, what I meant is that uh, he seemed to be 
telling people to return to the Torah and not follow these man-made laws of the Pharisees. Now, now that we understand Matthew 15, we really have a problem, don't we? Or actually, I don't have a problem, but you really have a problem. Because Matthew 15, Yeshua is very clearly warning his disciples not to follow the man-made laws and traditions of the Pharisees. But in Matthew 23, he says they have Mosaic authority. The Pharisees sit in the seat of Moses. Whatsoever they command you to do, that observe and do. So what's going on here? Matthew 15 very clearly is contradicting Matthew 23, the way it reads in the English. Well, when I first began to research this question, my first thing that I, that I did is I looked in the Greek, and I saw that the Greek says the exact same thing as the English. It didn't really help me. And at this point, I was pretty much out of ideas. And I went to a, a colleague of mine at the Hebrew University where I was studying, and he was a big expert in New Testament studies, and I said, can you point me in some direction here? Give me some kind of indication of how I should proceed to try and solve this problem. And he began to explain to me that according to some scholars, the New Testament wasn't written in Greek. It was actually written in Hebrew. And I thought that was very interesting, and I said, Hebrew? Why would you think the New Testament was written in Hebrew? And he explained to me that in certain parts of the New Testament, you have something which are called Hebraisms. Hebraisms are Hebrew thought patterns which are literally translated over into Greek, and when you read them in Greek, they, they sound like broken Greek. They sound like they were translated by a foreigner. It doesn't make sense. And let me illustrate to you what a Hebraism is by bringing you an Anglicism or an Anglicism. In English, we have an expression, dead as a doornail. Now imagine if I translated the phrase dead as a doornail into Chinese, and the Chinaman would come along and read, dead as a doornail? How dead is a doornail? What is that? It doesn't mean anything in Chinese at least as far as I know from Chinese, but uh, it certainly doesn't mean anything in Hebrew. Uh, and that's what a Hebraism is, these expressions and thought patterns that are translated over into Greek, and they make no sense in Greek. And what, what that means is you can read certain parts of the New Testament and see that they're clearly translated from another language, from Hebrew. Well, I began to read Matthew, Mark, Luke, Acts, and Revelations in Greek, and I could see, yes, they're full of these Hebraisms. They sound like they were translated from Hebrew, and I wasn't really clear how this helped me, though, with Matthew 23. Okay, so let's say these books were written in Hebrew. Here's the standard grammar of New Testament Greek, Blasted de Brunner. This is the grammar used in every seminary in the world, the standard grammar of New Testament Greek. And there it says, many expressions which a Greek would not have used, such as dead as a doornail, many expressions which a Greek would not have used were bound to creep into a faithful written translation of a Semitic original. So it's universally recognized by scholars that certain parts of the New Testament were written in a Semitic language and then translated into Greek. And the debates that go on between scholars is which parts of the New Testament and how much and what was that Semitic language? Was it Aramaic or was it Hebrew? And that's something I'll touch upon a little bit at the end, the question of Aramaic. But it's universally recognized that certain parts of the New Testament were written in a foreign language and translated. And as I was studying this, I saw, okay, we have these Hebraisms and, and I'm reading the New Testament in Greek. And, and, I, and I went back to my colleague at the university and I said, how did this help me? This is a very interesting homework assignment you gave me, but how did this help me? Ooh, how did that get in there? Uh, that's actually a picture of my dog, and I, and I thought this would be a good place to insert some comic relief in the middle of this intensive linguistic discussion. But basically, that's the look I had on my face when I was... I'm like, how does this help me? <laughs> and she really has nothing to do with the story other than that she's extremely beautiful. And, and I'm looking at him and I'm saying, you know, okay, Matthew 23... What does this have to do with the, being written in Hebrew? It doesn't help me. I, you know, I, <laughs> I don't have the Hebrew. And he said, oh, Nehemiah, I forgot to tell you the most important part. What's the most important he forgot to tell me? This most important part? That the uh, Hebrew version of the Gospel of Matthew has actually survived down to modern times. And that's known today as Shem Tov's Hebrew Matthew. Shem Tov's Hebrew Matthew is named after a rabbi who lived in 14th century Spain named Shem Tov Ibn Shaprut. And Shem Tov Ibn Shaprut lived during the Spanish Inquisition at a time that was plagued by something called the Disputations. The Disputations were public debates that were forced upon the Jews by their Catholic oppressors, and the Jews were forced to defend their religion against the Catholic religion, and it was pretty much a no-win situation for the Jews. If the Jews lost these debates, they could be forcibly converted to Catholicism. If they won the debates, they would very often have to flee town, flee Spain, because they've now insulted the Catholic religion. Well, most Jews would agree that it's better to have to flee town than, have to, than to be forcibly converted to Catholicism any day of the week and twice on Sunday. And Shem Tov Ibn Shaprut sat down and said, okay, I want to win these debates so I don't have to be a Catholic. And he sat down and he wrote a book called Evan Bochan, 
which translates into English as the test stone, in which he systematically goes through the arguments that the Jews could use in these debates. And interestingly enough, one of his main arguments was to systematically go through the words of Yeshua and show how the Catholics don't actually follow what Yeshua said. For example, he points out in his book that Yeshua upheld the Sabbath. And he says, how come you Catholics don't, follow, don't keep the Sabbath? Yeshua upheld the Sabbath. At the end of his book, shame to have been... All right, so let me just stop right here and just kind of establish the, what, the, what he just said in a timeline, right? So, um, the, uh, he, Shem Tov was, was debating in the 1400s, right? First of all, he established that the Greek, he, reading the Greek, he could tell that it had been translated from the Aramaic to the Greek, right? You guys understand that, that the, the, the disciples didn't speak Greek. They spoke Aramaic, and they wrote their letters and, and their work in Aramaic. It was translated to Greek because the ten tribes were in the Greek Isles at that time, and they spoke Greek. And so it went from Aramaic to Greek, and then, you know, we, we see this flopping back and forth, where his point is things are lost in translation, right? And so you get this Hebrewisms, where... There's a misunderstanding of of, uh, of of the translated word, right? And um, so he, he's pointing out that the Catholics in this debate didn't even know Yeshua because they didn't understand his Hebrewisms, right? They had their own perception of him, right? Mr. Prout says, if we Jews really want to win these debates, what we need to do is start reading the New Testament. And at the end of his book, he includes an appendix which is, was the Gospel of Matthew, of course, in Hebrew, because the whole book is in Hebrew. And because this was included as an appendix to the test stone, this became known as Shem Tov's Hebrew Matthew. Now, Shem Tov's Hebrew Matthew was known for centuries by Hebrew scholars. However, it was simply assumed that, that Shem Tov had translated his Matthew from Greek into Hebrew. That was just an assumption. And scholars never even bothered reading this book. They just assumed, because they assumed it was translated from Greek and that it wasn't really important. In the 1980s, a series of linguistic studies were carried out, and they found that Shemtov's Hebrew Matthew actually, actually has certain characteristics which make it sound like this book wasn't translated from Greek, but actually that it was written in Hebrew. And one of the main characteristics that you find in Shemtov's Hebrew Matthew are what are known as Hebrew word puns. A Hebrew word pun is when you take two similar-sounding Hebrew words, use them with different meanings in the same passage, and that creates a beautiful poetical style and a flow to the passage and every uh, ancient document written in Hebrew has these Hebrew word puns. The question is, though, what are they doing in a book that's supposedly translated from Greek? Well, first, let's look at some examples of Hebrew word puns. The Tanakh, the Old Testament, is full of Hebrew word puns. Literally every page of the Tanakh has Hebrew word puns. For example, in chapter 2, it says, The first man was called Adam, Adam, Adam. And it says he was taken from the ground Adama, Adam, Adama. Uh, man ground, that's a classic Hebrew word pun, two similar sounding Hebrew words with different meanings. Classic Hebrew word pun, when you read it in Hebrew, it flows and it's beautiful and, and it, it just, it makes perfect sense. Another Hebrew word pun appears at the end of Genesis 2. It says, the man and his wife were naked. Naked in Hebrew is arumim. In the very next verse it says, the, the snake was clever. Clever in Hebrew is... Yeah, I see that, you guys, and I'm sorry, it's running, it's running... It's because I've been commenting on this. We'll we'll stop right here and, and finish the other part in the next class. <clears throat> but um, this is starting to get into the really, you know, um, nitty gritty, so to speak, when it comes to understanding um, the Bible. So um, let's stop right there. I know it's getting late on the East Coast. It's, it's approaching 10 o'clock now. You guys, if you want to um, transition, I, I know some of you may be wanting to share something is uh i don't even see here yeah margie is here anybody want to share any code before we close out for tonight or is it too late i know we run long you guys but um i, I thought it would be about an hour i should i should have known better than that no nobody Any comments on on uh, on the teaching there? How about that? Are you guys that tired? No, nobody has anything to say. I think it was really good. Just running long. I get it. <laughs> <laughs> Speaking, I think. 
All right. Anyway, like I said in the beginning of this um, uh, meeting tonight, that uh, it was it was laid on me. This is really important to get these fundamental things down. Uh, if if we're going to understand the the scriptures and especially the hidden things in the codes, right? So, all right, I'm not going to keep you guys any any longer. I'm going to uh, get this uploaded and uh, probably um, you know put up tomorrow. Um, I, I may even put this on YouTube. Um, and then uh, we'll we'll see you guys in the next class on next Sunday, and uh, we'll we'll follow up with the rest of uh, Nehemiah's uh, presentation, which we're already more than halfway through. And then uh, we'll you know, get back to sharing codes and uh, working on methodology and things like that. How are you guys? Uh, let me pray for you, and then uh, we will see you next week, you guys. I appreciate your patience with me for this class and enduring that. I think it's it, it's it's important, right? Abba, you who I'm just so thankful, Father, for each one of these students. I ask that you go with them this week, Father, that you keep them protected and nurture them in your word, that you bring them back at the appointed time. We ask this in Yeshua's name. Amen. All right, you guys. Shalom to you. Have a good week. I'll see you in the next class. Um. Shalom. Shalom. Hello.